enjoy the week. Yeah, it was fun. Good morning and welcome to today's hearing on advancing our trade agenda and the World Trade Organization. Before hearing from Ambassador Punk, I'd like to make three points. First, after years of inaction, we now have an active agenda at the WTO, which can create new opportunities for U.S. exports and support American jobs. Our first order of business is ensuring that last year's trade facilitation agreement is fully adopted and implemented. We have an important deadline later this month, and I'm closely watching to see if the WTO can still function as an institution for negotiating and implementing new trade liberalization agreements. Implementing the, tr the trade facilitation agreement helps developing countries become more attractive for trade and investment. We're also trying to conclude negotiations to expand the information technology agreement, but I am frustrated by China's intransigence. Any final agreement must include key U.S. products. Failure to reach an ambitious agreement would reflect a serious failure in China's leadership as it hosts APEC this year. The Environmental Goods Agreement negotiations formally launched last week could cover nearly 90 percent of trade in environmental goods and provide an enormous boost to U.S. high-tech exports. And of course, we must continue our crucial enforcement and compliance work. Second point, beyond our current agenda, we must strengthen and improve the WTO, particularly by eliminating behind-the-border barriers. The WTO has been successful in reducing tariff barriers. For the organization to be relevant in the 21st century, however, it must address non-tariff barriers more effectively. These include, among others, government-induced border delays, unjustified regulatory rules, domestic content requirements, and sanitary and phytosanitary measures that impede U.S. agricultural experts, e exports. Continued work is also needed to ensure that countries meet their WTO obligations and to improve the WTO's dispute settlement system. At the same time, we cannot take up where we left off on the Doha round. Emerging market nations must take on meaningful obligations befitting their level of development. I look forward to hearing from Ambassador Punk about the administration's efforts to strengthen the WTO in each of these areas. Third, we must pass trade promotion authority without delay to ensure that our negotiators have the strongest negotiating hand possible. The Bipartisan Congressional Trade Priorities Act I co-sponsored earlier this year with Chairman Camp includes robust provisions on the WTO as well as multilateral, plurilateral, and bilateral negotiations, providing clear guidance to the administration about the type of agreements Congress will accept. I call on the administration to focus on passing trade promotion authority as soon as possible and to immediately work to lay the groundwork with their, with their Democratic colleagues. I will now, uh, we're going to wait on uh, Mr. Rangel. Uh, he's on his way uh, to give his opening statement, and I think we'll go right to you, Ambassador uh, Punk. Uh, before recognizing uh, you, uh, you know that you're limited to five minutes. Uh, your written statement will be paid, made part of the record, and you're now recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Nunes, Ranking Member uh, Rangel, uh, I'm anticipating his arrival, uh, and members of the Trade Subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity, opportunity to testify on the Obama Administration's priorities and recent developments at the World Trade Organization. The core of the Obama Administration's economic strategy is to create jobs, to promote growth, and to strengthen the middle class. The WTO is a critical part of that strategy. It sets the rules that govern the global trading system, and we believe it has the potential to do much more. That is why the United States led the charge at the WTO's ninth ministerial conference last December in Bali to complete the Trade Facilitation Agreement, or TFA, the first successful conclusion of a multilateral trade negotiation in the two-decade history of the WTO. It is why we are working on other major initiatives in Gen Geneva, including a group of key plurilateral agreements which have the potential to reinvigorate the multilateral trading system and to help the WTO meet its potential. In Bali, WTO members concluded a package of significant results that include the TFA and important outcomes on agriculture and development. We are now actively engaged in implementing all of the Bali outcomes in keeping with the very specific timelines and procedures agreed to unanimously by all WTO members. The TFA is a huge accomplishment for the WTO reestablishing that its members can reach significant multilateral outcomes. The rest of the Doha round remains a challenge. 
We are working to develop a post poly work pl program by the end of this year. This will help to determine whether conclusion of the Doha round is possible. The worst case scenario for the WTO after the Bali success would be renewed drift. The time has come for the WTO to conclude Doha, move forward, and take up new areas of trade. A final Doha agreement must address key U.S. priorities, including in agriculture, industrial market access, and services. There will be no Doha result without balance across all of these areas and across all of the major trading countries. For Doha to succeed, as we have emphasized uh, consistently, the emerging developing countries must carry their weight as well. In parallel with the Bali results and post-Bali work, we have created other opportunities by leading regional and plurilateral negotiations with like-minded trade partners. The Trade and Services Agreement, or TISA, represents a unique opportunity among 23 participants representing 50 WTO members to build a new agreement that incorporates the best of what the United States has been achieving in this sector in our free trade agreements. We have high expectations for TISA to provide increased market access and potential rules to support expansion of services trade into the future. Just last week, we launched negotiations on the new Environmental Goods Agreement with 13 other WTO members, representing 86 percent of global trade in environmental goods. Elimination of tariffs on environmental technologies will make these goods more available and boost U.S. jobs. ITA expansion holds out similar promise for boosting simultaneously the WTO's credibility and exports of high-quality American technology. If we are successful, and there is more work to do with our Chinese colleagues, as you know to Mr. Chairman, the ITA will be the first tariff-cutting agreement at the WTO in 17 years. From day one, the Obama administration has made enforcement a key priority to ensure that American stakeholders get the full benefits of the market opportunities we have negotiated. When direct engagement with the trading partner is not successful, we do not hesitate to use WTO dispute settlement. The United States has brought 18 WTO complaints since 2009. We have brought disputes in areas such as trade distorting subsidies, export restraints, import licensing barriers, local content requirements, retaliatory use of trade remedies, and non-science-based SPS measures. Those disputes involve major trading partners, such as China, India, Indonesia, and Argentina, and we have had significant successes. We will continue to prosecute and defend these disputes, launch new disputes as appropriate, and insist that WTO members live up to their obligations. To conclude, certainly we see challenges ahead, but also great potential for using WTO and other negotiations to promote opportunities for American workers, farmers, ranchers, businesses of all sizes, and most importantly, American families. In this regard, let me say something about Trade Promotion Authority. To actively and effectively pursue these initiatives and bring benefits home to Americans, we will need TPA. TPA is the mechanism by which Congress has worked with presidents since 1974 to give the executive its marching orders about what to negotiate, how to work with Congress before and during negotiations, and how Congress will take up and approve or disapprove the final agreement. We agree with those who say that TPA needs to be updated, and we look forward to working with this committee and Congress as a whole to secure a TPA that has as broad bipartisan support as possible. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ambassador. We'll now, uh, rec I'll now recognize uh, the ranking member, Mr. Rangel, for the purpose of offering an opening statement. I'll be brief, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I congratulate you for assuming this great responsibility, Ambassador. I uh, congratulate the work that the World Trade Organization is doing, and you guiding America for fairness and equity. I know that your job is to enforce the cases or to, to study the cases that are brought to you, but there's certain challenges that we have with cyber, with uh, internet theft, with uh, intellectual property, and uh, perhaps the WTO can issue guidelines so that countries will know that uh, they should not have to wait until the offended country uh, brings an action. Another problem that we face with the trade agreements as well as the, uh, the president's authority is that it's hard to give the president authority to do and not to do when you have no clue as to what's going to be in the agreement. You know, it would be great if you had a TPA telling the president to do the right thing. But uh, recognizing that there's a need for the Congress, for the negotiations not to be public, 
and at the same time not know what authority to restrict or expand of the president legislatively is a very, very difficult job. But uh, uh, we, we value and welcome uh, advice that you can give us as legislators so that we can be supportive of the executive branch, recognizing that trade doesn't involve 535 of us in order to reach a conclusion. But thanks for the work that you do, and I'm very concerned about China's violation of the principles of fair trade, which she agreed to do, and seemingly uh, it's up to the United States to bring the allegations to the WTO instead of having some way of making certain that countries fulfill their obligations to the organization without a country having to come forward and make the accusation. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ringel. Uh, I'm now going to yield to the former chairman of the Trade Committee and our current chairman of the Health Committee on Ways and Means, Mr. Brady. Chairman Nunes, first, thanks for your leadership and all the new energy you bring to the trade agenda uh, in Congress. Ambassador Punk, um, you're doing a terrific no. job. Uh, not merely in representing the U.S. negotiating agreements so critical to, the, to our economy, but the time you take in consulting with both parties in the House and Senate on uh, the nuances, the politics, the dynamics, the details of these agreements. And, I, and, I, and I'm not complimenting you merely because your wife and daughter are in the audience today, but they do need to hear that you have a very broad support in the House, and we appreciate your work. Let me ask a broader question. Um, you know, the Doha round has lapsed uh, now for nearly six years. Um, there is real progress on 21st century uh, issues from trade facilitation, move, moving these goods and, uh, quicker, faster, cheaper across the borders to the benefit of consumers around the world. Um, we're seeing progress in information technology in services agreement, in the environmental goods area. There are some who are, because of the volley round, seem to believe the focus now should really go back to Doha. And this is not a good analogy, but it seems to me that after a dozen years, the, the Doha garden, for various reasons, simply isn't producing. But in services and facilitation and information technology and others, that, you know, I think we're seeing real growth you know, real, real results in those areas. I'd like to see you and us as, as a country gr continue to focus on the garden that's growing, on the results that are producing for the economy we have today. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on whether you agree on that approach or whether we ought to shift focus back to the Doha round. Uh, well, thanks very much, Congressman Brady, and I've uh, very much appreciated the opportunity I've had to, to consult uh, with you and your colleagues uh, in the time that I'm back in Washington. It's, it's very much informed our positions across a, a whole range of issues. But, but to answer your, your question directly about sort of the interplay between some of these plurilateral discussions in Geneva, like the ITA, uh, TISA, environmental goods, and the broader Doha agenda, uh, I, I very much agree that the place where we have uh, vitality and energy in the room and a sense of like-mindedness among uh, negotiating partners has been in, in, in the plurilateral discussions. And quite honestly, it's very refreshing after a, a long day uh, in deadlocked uh, discussions to step into some of these plurilateral negotiations and recognize that even if you're negotiating uh, with people who might have a slightly different perspective, uh, all of you are working towards uh, the ultimate goal of, of a result in liberalizing trade. And so those plurilateral discussions are on their own track, and they will continue, and we will push them uh, and lead in those discussions uh, as we move forward. I do think that there is the potential for uh, us to make progress uh, on Doha, despite the fact that we're now uh, 14 years into that yeah. negotiation. But I think one of the points that you made is really critical there. Uh, and I think the uh, Chairman Nunes made the, a, a similar point. Uh, we can't simply uh, keep going back to things that haven't worked in the past. I, I think about the, the uh, Einstein 
uh, maxim that you know the definition of insanity is yeah. to do the same thing and over, over and over and expect a different result. There's been too much of that in Geneva. So Bali has given us uh, a puff of wind uh, in our sails, uh, the first one in a long time in terms of a, a broad multilateral discussion. We have an opportunity this year if we are willing all of the members of the WTO to wrestle with difficult questions like the appropriate role of emerging economies to make progress uh, on Doha, but we can only make progress if we uh, address those issues very directly. Yeah. And I'm not trying to downplay Doha. In fact, mm -hmm. having, having broader agreements uh, obviously I think would be uh, better for the global economy. It just seems to me the work that's being done in the other areas actually builds confidence, creates a better environment, and, and, and provides some time where we can go back with more agreement on trying to grow that garden that's Doha. But right now we're really, I, I guess my point is, I think the progress we're seeing is important in those agreements. I think they help build uh, the type of dynamics that allow us to, to tackle Doha in the future. I don't want to shift focus at this point where we're seeing that growth. Well, uh, we agree with that, uh, with that premise, and, uh, and we will, the worst case scenario from our standpoint is for Doha to continue to drift. Uh, we think there needs to be resolution with Doha, and we are pushing for that pointed uh, discussion uh, now. Uh, and I agree with you on another point, which is I think that the plurilateral discussions have actually had a very virtuous impact on Doha because they have demonstrated very clearly to the small number of countries that don't want anything to happen in Geneva that there are options there for those uh, that are seeking to use the institution uh, in a productive way. Great. Thanks, Ambassador. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Brady. Now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Neal, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick thought on uh, Mr. Brady's comments. The committee has been pretty bipartisan on trade. And uh, just to pick up on something that, that Kevin said, uh, I do think that the collapse of Doha aided the bilaterals and moved them up on the agenda. So I think there was that sort of benefit. If we can't do the big then let's proceed with the, the smaller bilaterals where we actually have had some, some success. But let me talk a little bit about the suggestion I made to President Obama at the White House about a month ago. And I suggested that uh, we really focus the European trade proposal, TTIP, and suggested that I thought that was easier for all of us to do, and I thought that the uh, Pacific proposal is uh, a longer climb, to be very candid. And I thought that in an effort to build some confidence, Mr. Ambassador, that we might be able to focus on what is now almost uh, 30 percent of the world's trade and investment. And it strikes me that uh, the relationship that we have with Europe, given uh, the difficulty it would be to make the argument that we were somehow trading down with countries that have a very similar uh, quality of life and enjoy similar economic success, that uh, we might embrace with more vigor that whole notion had a chance the other night at the Italian Embassy to once again make the case for uh, moving uh, TTIP along. But there are some non-tariff barriers that remain important to U.S. exports to European Union. And the EU, EU's regulatory and legislative processes also do not typically provide essential and meaningful opportunities for WTO members and their stakeholders to comment on regulatory proposals. Could you speak to what could be done in TTIP or at WTO to otherwise help coax our European counterparts to provide more meaningful opportunities to comment on regulatory proposals so that Americans, American small and medium-sized businesses are not at an economic disadvantage? Uh, thank you very much, Congressman Neal. That's uh, uh, one of the central uh, uh, goals for us in the TTIP negotiations. But I, I want to step back for just one minute. Uh, I do think we have, uh, you know, USTR is a, a small agency, as, as the people on this uh, committee know very well. But I do think we very much have the capacity to pursue uh, multiple discussions at the same time. Uh, my colleagues, uh, I, I work more on WTO and, and TTIP issues. Uh, my colleagues at, uh, back in, in the Winder building uh, work on, on TPP. But I do see us as having the capacity to, to pursue all of these things simultaneously. But with regard to, to, to TTIP specifically, and, and especially with regard to the regulatory issue that, that you have mentioned, one of our biggest goals has been 
to pursue the so-called uh, horizontal regulatory issues, uh, which is to say exactly the types of issues that you're raising. In the U.S. system, uh, through our notice and comment process, uh, all interested parties, foreign and domestic, have the opportunity to see uh, draft regulations and to comment on them and to have those comments taken into account by regulators in making decisions about the, the final shape that regulations should take. We don't have those same opportunities in the European system. And that is something that we think is uh, an, uh, enormously important for our stakeholders uh, to have, uh, uh, transparency in terms of, of making regulations, access in terms of an opportunity to provide input at, at critical junctures, and then accountability on the part of European regulators to respond to those uh, uh, comments that they hear. Now, we're not seeking a guaranteed outcome, but we believe that that, that process uh, in and of itself results in, in much better uh, uh, regulatory outcomes. And in a transatlantic context, it creates uh, the opportunity for there being, being fewer impediments uh, to trade as a result of unnecessary regulatory differences. So that's an issue that I appreciate your support on because it's something where we're, we're working very hard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Neal. Uh, Mr. Reichert is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Welcome, Ambassador. Uh, so your wife and your daughter are in the audience. Uh, is your brother here too? <laughs> you know, he's in town and he didn't come today, so I guess I should be very offended. Uh, he's off the Christmas list. Hey, uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for recognizing in your opening comments the importance of TPA. I think uh, most members here recognize uh, that TPA is, is critical to uh, any agreement associated with TPP. Um, and uh, uh, I think we've made it very clear on our side of the aisle that if an agreement comes to this Congress without TPA, it's dead on arrival. So uh, I look forward to working with you and other members of our USTR, Ambassador Frohm, et etc., and the administration on uh, moving uh, Mr. Camp's uh, initiative forward um, for Trade Promotion Authority. It's, it's bipartisan. It's bicameral. Um, a lot of work been done on it, and we need to we need to help. We need some help to move that forward here. Also, like to just thank you uh, and your colleagues for the work. Uh, at WTO and challenging Indonesia's uh, import restrictions on agricultural products. Um, in Indonesia, as you know, is a top market for Washington's high-quality apples, and uh, it was very critical uh, uh, for them, and we appreciate your fighting for our growers in Washington State. Um, got a, a couple of questions, um, and I'm, I'm happy to see that uh, you have launched negotiations for a plurilateral agreement on environmental goods. This is a significant opportunity, I think, to increase our exports in environmental goods and lower prices for uh, consumers. Are there major global traders in environmental goods that are not currently a part uh, or a party to the negotiation? And, and what's your plan to bring them into the process? Well, uh, let me address that very specifically. Uh, we have, uh, have faced this question in, in other plurilateral discussions about uh, whether or not to sort of uh, actively seek uh, countries' participation in plurilateral negotiations. And I think the, uh, the, the viewpoint that we've, we've landed upon is that what makes the plurilaterals work is the fact that the, the countries that are there are like-minded and want to get a result. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, that doesn't mean we don't uh, uh, have disagreements within the group. It doesn't mean we don't argue with each other and negotiate very hard for, for national interests. But there is a common desire to, to reach an agreement and to be ambitious. And so we have been, uh, uh, we have not done work, we have deliberately not done work to solicit members to come in to the various uh, plurilateral discussions, whether it's uh, TISA uh, or the Environmental Goods Agreement. Because our experience uh, 
Uh, it's, and, and this is a metaphor that only works in Washington, so I'm very happy to be able to use it here. Uh, this doesn't work in Geneva. It, it's Tom Sawyer and the picket fence. Uh, we want people who want to, uh, to, to paint the picket fence uh, on their own. Uh, we don't want people uh, negotiating before they come into the negotiation about whether they should be there. And we've had good success with that dynamic in, in the context of TISA. We started the TISA negotiation, for example, with, with 15 members, and we've had uh, eight join that discussion without doing any recruiting. Uh, you ask if there are countries outside of the environmental goods agreement that we would like to see in. There certainly are. And I, I would expect that we will have more that will see it as being in their own interest uh, to be a part of that discussion. We're, we're already hearing uh, inquiries in Geneva. And so I think you'll see that, that grow over time. But frankly, we already have a very good uh, set there. I think uh, currently about 86 percent of, uh, of global environmental goods trade. Great. Thank you. Uh, do you have a t I'm sure you have a timeline for negotiations, but could you elaborate on your, on your plan to avoid a free rider problem? The, there is a free rider problem that is built into uh, plural, plurilaterals that are based on goods trade uh, because of the MFN principle in uh, the WTO. In TISA, we have a very unique situation where the existing WTO rules explicitly allow us to have a plurilateral negotiation whose benefits are not provided on an MFN basis to the rest of the organization. Unfortunately, we don't have that same uh, benefit when it comes to goods trade. And so whether it's ITA or environmental goods, uh, whatever benefits the members decide among themselves, they have to share with the rest of the membership. And as you point out, that creates a free rider problem. What that means is that uh, we really uh, we're not in a position to, to we won't be in a position to conclude a deal if key players are not a part of it because there are certain players, for example, China, uh, that we would never allow to be a free rider uh, on something like the Information Technology Agreement or the Environmental Goods Agreement. Uh, fortunately, China is a part of both of those discussions, although uh, in the context of ITA, uh, with mixed results to date. But that is the challenge of having key players inside of the negotiation so that they take on obligations and are not uh, able to free ride. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The time of gentleman has expired. I'll now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Buchanan, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to thank the ambassador for your service. Let me just start out in a general question. Uh, I get asked quite a bit about the effectiveness of WTO. Uh, I know it's a rulemaking body. Uh, it's, it is the body and you're our main interface, what's, what's your general feeling about how effective it is in general as it impacts the world and then as it uh, relates to the U.S.? Well, it's something I spend a lot of time thinking about, and I've, I've, I've had the privilege of being in this job for about four and a half years now, and, and, I've, I've, and so I've seen this unfold over a little bit of a, of a time frame here now. I guess, to me, there are a couple of lessons that I've, I've drawn out of that. Uh, and, and the starting point, I think, is that uh, a very frank acknowledgement that, especially when it comes to its negotiating arm, we need to do a lot, the institution needs to do a lot better because the notion that we're in the at 14 years into a negotiation is not a good way of advertising the WTO as a place for doing serious business. But uh, I think in terms of lessons learned that one of the most important ones is the importance uh, of of creative approaches. And that's something that I think the U.S. Has, has pushed very hard in the WTO context, is not falling into this trap of trying, to, of trying the same thing over and over again and expecting a, diff a, a different result. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we have pushed uh, plurilaterals, for example, so aggressively uh, over the course of the, last, of the last four years. I think it's critical that we make the WTO relevant for our stakeholders today. And that goes back in some ways to, to, for example, addressing the issue of emerging economies. It's impossible to have a meaningful discussion about an issue like agricultural subsidies, for example, uh, if two of the four largest agricultural subsidizers in the world, namely India and China, are not a part of that discussion. And yeah, yet, let me get a couple more questions. That sorry. Run out. Let me just jump to, just in terms of the uh, TF agreement, 
what I've read is there's a trillion dollars in benefit to the global economy, 21 million jobs. Uh, it could impact uh, not only a lot of U.S. companies but others. But it seems like the, the countries that would benefit the most are the ones that are uh, in terms of uh, India and Africa, I guess half of the benefit would ideally go to them. What's the holdup? Why aren't they supportive? And what are we doing about it, I guess? Well, that's a very important question. Uh, you know, we had a very important agreement at Bali uh, with trade facilitation, as you mentioned. And the agreement is very explicit about the timelines for implementing trade facilitation and for implementing other parts of, of our work plan in Geneva. Uh, we have been concerned about statements by uh, a handful of WTO members indicating that they intend somehow to link uh, these already agreed implementation deadlines to issues uh, that are not a part uh, of trade facilitation and that have different deadlines. Uh, there's been a lot of mixed signals on that front over the course of the last several weeks, uh, including with regard specifically to India. And so we are hoping that by the time that we have this meeting in Geneva next week in the General Council, that we, we will be able to move forward and all of us do what we committed to do, which is implement, uh, uh, adopt uh, the protocol of accession uh, on the timeline that we agreed. Yeah. And let me just uh, close with this one point. Uh, many of us were in, in Tokyo a month or so ago, and as relates, you touched on TPA. It was, the, you know, a lot of the... Uh, at least the comments that I got back, everybody was concerned that we should put that in place. This administration should have uh, the uh, TPA, it should get passed. Um, people are concerned about, you know, as it related to our ongoing relationships, they were afraid that they'd get something negotiated and it wouldn't get done. Uh, what's your sense of, you know, where we're at and what do we got to do to get it done? Well, uh, Congressman, we are very committed to, uh, to, to getting TPA. Uh, I think uh, Ambassador Froman has, has practically camped up here over the course of the, of the last six weeks in terms of the outreach that he's done personally. Uh, other members of the Cabinet uh, have been involved in this, whether it's Secretary Kerry, Secretary Liu, uh, Secretary of Commerce, Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, the President has indicated, uh, uh, including in the State of the Union address, uh, his commitment to, uh, to seeking and, and uh, achieving a, a Trade Promotion Authority agreement. We're looking for an agreement that has the broadest uh, bipartisan support possible. At the same time, as you mentioned, uh, we're committed to, to ambitious outcomes in all of the negotiations that we're working on. And I think it's possible, and it has been possible, based on our experience at the table, uh, for those two tracks to, to proceed at the same time. Thank you. The time of gentleman has expired. Now recognize Mr. Smith uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you, uh, Ambassador, uh, for your presence here today and your service. Uh, I think, obviously, you've uh, got an important job, and we appreciate uh, your service. Uh, we know that you know, the WTO rules-based uh, talk about enforcement uh, and dispute uh, settlement and uh, ways to truly level the playing field on an international trade. And we know that uh, tariff elimination is, is a high priority, but it seems that uh, non-tariff trade barriers are becoming more and more uh, of an issue, and uh, obviously that creates increases in costs and uncertainty, and uh, oftentimes are often at the borders of countries which can at least afford it. And last year, this subcommittee held a hearing on, on India, as you know. At the time, I provided an example of a Nebraska company faced with inconsistent tariff rates and unreasonable regulatory requirements in India, even though the market does exist uh, for the product. And uh, this was a common theme throughout the hearing. While India is not the only WTO partner unfairly blocking imports uh, through non-tariff barriers, this does reflect on the overarching fact that a number of our global trading partners, even those with uh, the large markets and a huge trading presence, continue to unfairly block uh, U.S. goods, uh, and most notably in agriculture. So for this reason and, and many others, uh, uh, we here on the panel uh, were encouraged by the WTO trade facilitation agreement announced last year in Bali. While the goal is to have non-tariff barriers addressed completely, uh, this agreement is designed to address the costs and time associated with clearing customs, and customs facilitation would be a very positive step, especially the uh, perishable goods such as agriculture products. 
And now, we're, now we are hearing reports certain countries, uh, like I said, India, for example, are backing out of commitments uh, to meet the agreement. Uh, the one thing I hear uh, again and again in the trade arena is the importance uh, of this accountability. And I'm just wondering if you could reflect a bit on the timeline. We know that the interim deadline is quickly approaching. And can you uh, discuss the timeline uh, that is involved here? Well, with regard to trade facilitation specifically, the, the Bali agreement is crystal clear uh, on the timeline. By July 31st, uh, which is to say in uh, two weeks, uh, the members of the WTO are to have concluded this so-called protocol of accession, uh, which is a very short agreement that essentially is the, uh, the launching document for everyone to go seek domestic uh, uh, ratification. Also by the 31st of July, developing countries are to uh, submit their first report about their, the timelines that they anticipate with regard to the implementation of some of the specific obligations in the trade facilitation agreement. So that deadline is crystal clear. Now you uh, mentioned, and, and, and as, as did others, that, that there have been uh, uh, some inconsistent signals uh, from India. And uh, we are extremely concerned about that. Uh, we are very, uh, we're working very hard in the Obama administration to get off to a uh, good start with the new Indian government. At Bali, when we concluded the trade facilitation agreement, we worked very closely, we negotiated very hard with India, they negotiated very hard with us, but we reached an agreement. And obviously we have an expectation, as you pointed out, that our trading partners will live up to their commitments. Uh, it also is critical to the WTO and the credibility of the WTO that this one agreement that we've been able to achieve in its 20-year uh, history uh, not evaporate uh, six months after it was concluded. So for all of those reasons, this is a, uh, a source of, of uh, an awful lot of work on our part in trying to make sure that everyone sticks to what was agreed and implements the agreement starting with July 31st. Okay. Uh, would you agree that perhaps failure of, of – uh uh, reaching an agreement here actually negatively impacts consumers not only here at home but uh, abroad? There, there is no question in my mind that, uh, that the trade facilitation agreement has enormous benefits for every member of the WTO. And, uh, and there is overwhelming academic evidence that the biggest benefits of trade facilitation uh, accrue in developing economies that are less integrated into the global economy. So I believe that the, the single most important development outcome that we achieved in, in Bali was the trade facilitation agreement, despite the fact that we didn't call it a development right. agreement. Okay. Uh, switching gears just a bit be, before I run out of time, we know that Mexico and Hong Kong uh, have lifted their remaining age-based restrictions on, on U.S. beef. And I was just wondering, you know, there are several other countries that have not lifted those age-based restrictions, even though scientific evidence uh, abounds uh, relating to that. Uh, is the administration considering uh, pursuing some WTO action on that topic? Well, uh, Congressman, my hometown is in Torrington, Wyoming, uh, which is about eight miles from the, the Nebraska border. And right on the border is a uh, feedlot. Uh, so this is an issue that, uh, that, that I understand uh, uh, perhaps from a similar perspective uh, of you, despite being uh, slightly across the border. Uh, we are uh, dedicated in, uh, in this administration and, and at USTR uh, that international rules on trade be based on science. And we're pursuing that principle across uh, numerous uh, issues, uh, including our efforts to, to promote uh, beef exports. Uh, and we will very much continue to do that. Okay, very, uh, very well. Thank you very much. Thank the gentleman. Uh, the gentlelady from Kansas, Ms. Jenkins, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this important hearing, and we thank you, Ambassador, for, for being here and for your good work. Uh, my home state of Kansas is a major producer of beef and pork, and as was shown in this committee's last hearing, the U.S. livestock industry is very frustrated with difficulties of opening the Japanese market, and I can assure you that my constituents share that frustration. 
but the truth is the European Union has never come into compliance with the WTO findings in the beef hormones and biotech cases, sanitary and phytosanitary cases in which the U.S. has prevailed. Do you have any suggestions on how the U.S. should manage the EU's failure to respect its obligations under the WTO SPS agreement? And do you believe that ultimately a transatlantic trade investment partnership agreement offers a better opportunity to get the EU into compliance? Well, I think what is critical with regard to all of these difficult issues, and certainly the issues that you uh, cited are among some of the more, more difficult issues that we have bilaterally, whether it's, it's Japan or the European Union, is that we use all of the tools in our toolbox to promote our interests. And so you mentioned uh, uh, WTO rules and WTO litigation. And, and, and as, you, as you pointed out, uh, those are tools that we are applying and have applied in the context uh, uh, of Europe. Uh, Europe, in fact, is, is paying compensation, having lost a case uh, on, on beef hormones. Uh, now, that being said, as you point out, we are, are not yet satisfied in terms of our efforts to ensure that our uh, bilateral trade is conducted on the basis of science. And so I think that TTIP does provide uh, an opportunity, another opportunity, for us to pursue this conversation uh, with Europe. And we're doing that. In fact, uh, as we speak, uh, USTR has a, a team of negotiators in Brussels who are engaged in the sixth round of TTIP negotiations. Uh, there is a specific uh, uh, interaction uh, over the course of this week on SPS issues. And part of that discussion includes issues uh, like beef hormones. Part of that uh, discussion includes issues uh, like biotech. And so we are, uh, we, we are not where we need to be yet uh, in terms of results, but we are at the table uh, literally today uh, and using every, every one of the tools that we have at our capacity to try and uh, achieve a, a science-based result. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Are you back? Thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Bustani, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Ambassador Punk, congratulations on Bali, and thank you for the outstanding work you're doing along with your team. I want to revisit the uh, trade facilitation agreement because of the recent hurdles that have emerged. And um, given the importance of this, first multilateral since the formation of the WTO in 1994, this is really important and all the nations will benefit, especially the African countries, India, Brazil, and so forth. And yet, um, everything seemed to be a go. We're just two weeks away from the, the deadline for the uh, protocol of accession. Um, and now India has created this difficulty by trying to merge uh, some food security issues which should be dealt with in 2017. And I'm trying to understand what exactly is going on with that because we have a new Indian government under Prime Minister Modi who's touted himself as a pro-business individual, somebody who wants to engage more not only in, in opening up the business uh, atmosphere in, in, within India but also internationally. This is baffling to me and so I was hoping you might shed a little more light on that. And secondly, uh, the members of the African Union who have also raised a separate issue, I think it's with funding or to help build capacity for, for, um, uh, for the facilitation agreement. Are the Indians and Africans collaborating on this, or is this, are these two separate uh, developments? Well, I, I, I don't know the degree to which there's interplay between uh, between the Indians and Africans in terms of their of their discussions. They're they're they are raising in some cases slightly different issues, and so maybe I'll address uh, address them separately. Uh, with regard uh, to India, as you pointed out, uh, uh, there have been conflicting signals uh, even in the last 24 hours as to where India intends to come down on fulfilling its obligation uh, under the trade facilitation agreement. And we're certainly hopeful that the more positive signals that we've heard are the ones that will prevail in Geneva at the General Council meeting next week. Uh, 
Uh, Ambassador Froman uh, left Washington yesterday for a meeting of G20 ministers in Sydney. I'll be joining him there on Saturday. And this is an issue that we will be raising along with other G20 members uh, very directly with India in an effort to get clarity on exactly where, where the Indians stand. I do remain hopeful that, that the positive signals will, will be the ones that prevail. With regard to Africa, uh, there is uh, one of the, you point out, I think one of the most perplexing aspects of this, which is that what every African country is doing domestically is seeking to improve its trade facilitation systems. What, what the Africans are doing regionally is regional cooperative efforts to improve trade facilitation. And so the notion that we wouldn't also cooperate on this issue multilaterally in the WTO is perplexing. And uh, that being said, we were able to reach an agreement. Uh, and the more recent signals from most of the Africans have been positive in terms of, of following through uh, on their, their obligations. There are a couple of, of uh, outlier signals from, uh, from a very small handful uh, of African countries, but obviously we're hopeful that they will also uh, respect their obligations by the time we get to the, the key moment next week. Yeah, I hope so. I know uh, the administration put forth this Power Africa initiative. Mike Froman's been very much involved in it, and that ought to be a clear signal that the United States is committed. But given the fact that trade facilitation will help these countries immensely, it's just it's truly perplexing that uh, they, they've taken this initial step. And I, I hope we can get through it, because earlier, as you said, uh, this trade facilitation agreement has basically the impact of creating a virtuous uh, cycle with regard to Doha and the actions of India and Africa, these African countries, threaten to take us back to where we were with the impasse on Doha, and that's, that's a big concern I have. Finally, I just want to quickly ask you, you and I talked about China and the ITA. Um, I'm, I was in China in March, as you know, and we pushed them really hard. Uh, I think whole of government we're pushing. And do you think we'll get a breakthrough at APEC uh, with, uh, the, with President Xi? Well, I'm, I'm hopeful we don't uh, – uh, I'm, I'm extremely hopeful that we will, we will have an agreement. And, uh, but we are not there yet. Uh, as you pointed out, uh, China is hosting APEC this year. And uh, we had been without even uh, dialogue uh, with China for – for almost six months prior to the APEC meeting in, in Qingdao in May. There was incremental but positive progress on ITA at the, on the margins of the Qingdao meeting in, uh, in May. Uh, I was in uh, Beijing last week with, with Ambassador Froman and with a, a number of, of members of the President's Cabinet in the context of the SNED discussions. We pushed this issue very hard, uh, not just Ambassador Froman, but also Secretary, uh, Secretary Kerry, also Secretary Liu, and we made more incremental progress. But we, we still aren't where we need to be in, uh, I think, achieving uh, what the chairman referred to as a sufficiently uh, long list where China is making uh, an appropriate contribution to the, uh, to the overall agreement. We're going to keep pushing, and uh, I think we can get there, but, but we're not there yet. Mr. Chairman, I think we need to send a strong signal to the Chinese to reach that level of ambition on ITA. I mean, they're one of the world's largest exporters of technology products, and for them to, to really, in effect, wreck this deal is, is not good. This is an opportunity for the, uh, the new leadership in China to step up internationally and provide leadership and, and do the right thing uh, for the international community. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Ms. Roscom, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador, I want to shift gears if I could um, and move from the, the details and on the ground sort of insights that you've been able to provide, and I've learned a great deal from this morning, and I thank you for that, to um, a little bit more of a philosophical question. And so let me, let, me, let me lay a premise out, and I'd be interested, if you think my premise is right, 
um, and what your observations are as somebody that's, that's driving U.S. trade policy and really having an impact all around the globe. And here's what I've observed. I think that there is a, um, a palpable ambiguity in the United States on what the U.S. role should be in the world today. On the political left, and I don't want to overcharacterize it, but you, you'll, you'll get my drift. On the political left, there's this feeling of, and it's kind of a, an, uh, a hangover from Vietnam, a hangover from the, the, the debate about Iraq and weapons of mass destruction and so forth. And there's this natural reluctance to assert American power around the world. On my side of the aisle, in my party, there is a um, a growing isolationism that is now becoming manifest in our debates and so forth, and it's shrouded in budget talk, you know, we can't afford this and so forth. And so here's my question. So what have you observed as somebody who's really uniquely on the global scene and interacting all around the world, literally? How does trade fit in to the assertion of American Influence, and I'm not talking sharp elbowed, have it our way. But I'm, I am, I am of the view that the United States and our presence around the world is a good thing. Uh, an Asian ambassador yesterday put it very elegantly to me in my office, and he said, "We miss you more than ever." Meaning the United States. Can you give me your observations about how these, how trade fits in to this, this? overall influence that we're trying to have as, you know, as the Navy puts it, as a global force for good. It sounds like a bumper sticker, but it's a very apt way of trying to describe this. How does trade fit into this whole milieu? Well, I think it's a very interesting uh, question and a very interesting premise. Uh, I, w I would disagree with the, the uh, Asian ambassador who would indicate in any way that, uh, that the U.S. Has been, has been missing. And I think what, in listening to your question, what, what I thought of was, was actually just the opposite in the, sense, in the following sense. Uh, one of the things that I think is unique about this, this moment historically in terms of U.S. leadership is the degree to which we've put ourselves uh, really at the, at the center pivot of critical discussions. We are at the center pivot of uh, a discussion about Asian trade through TPP. We're at the center pivot of a discussion about Atlantic trade in TTIP. We're at the center pivot of an effort to, to make the WTO a more productive place through leadership in TISA and uh, ITA and environmental goods. So uh, I really see us as being very well uh, positioned right now uh, uh, if we can consummate those agreements. And uh, that is the question that I think, from a philosophical standpoint, is, is the challenging one, is how do we build a bipartisan coalition that is supportive of trade uh, along, uh, and those agreements that I just described? Because the key thing from my perspective is that those agreements are the way that we have an opportunity to not only create economic opportunities for U.S. stakeholders, but also to promote our values uh, globally. And the thing that is frustrating to me sometimes is I think that uh, sometimes opponents of these agreements forget that this isn't happening in the abstract. Our rivals are out there very actively seeking to put their own uh, uh, systems in place. And for example, in the context of TPP, uh, we can be very certain uh, that if TPP did not succeed, uh, that uh, the Chinese would be uh, quite happy to fill that vacuum uh, with their RCEP uh, agreement. And I can guarantee you that uh, values and concerns that we have about things like environmental protection, consumer protection, labor rights, will be far better served uh, under TPP uh, than they would be under, under Chinese leadership. It seems that one of the areas where we can all work together, the administration and this committee in particular, and, and you sense a strong bipartisan commitment to, to free trade, is to articulate at home how this is a winner for us, how this is a winner for our consumers, how this is a winner for our producers. And we need to shun the sort of thinking that says, no, this is a zero-sum game and the only way somebody else benefits is at our expense. And so to the extent that we can be um, actively participating with you in that debate, I'd be honored to, to play that role. 
gentleman yields back and I recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ambassador, for your uh, service. And uh, following along with a number of the uh, uh, concerns that uh, my colleagues uh, have addressed, I uh, always like to try to take it back to uh, my district and uh, uh, to a place called Augie and Ray's. Uh, I don't know that you've been there, Ambassador, but uh, if you ever get the chance, I highly recommend it. Uh, Larson Special's not bad, but uh, uh, but it's at Augie and Ray's that uh, you hear the unfiltered uh, opinion uh, of the community. And I'm talking about everybody from the Chamber of Commerce to uh, the insurance industry to machinists at uh, uh, Pratt & Whitney. And it's there that... Uh, we see this uh, growing uh, skepticism and uh, divide about trade. And it's a great irony coming from a state that is primarily an export state uh, that uh, relies on, uh, on trade. And uh, I think uh, a lot of the angst uh, comes from uh, both the implementation of trade agreements with unenforceable provisions AKA such as the labor provisions in NAFTA, and also the enforceable provisions that while useful often require years of deliberation and considerable amounts of money before the enforcement actually takes place. Uh, while the administration clearly has uh, been aggressive in utilizing the enforcement mechanisms available in the WTO, it's clear that more must be done to ensure that nations are living up to the standards that they agreed on. To Mr. Roskam's point, I think that that would better uh, uh, have the public have a stronger feeling about it. So I have three uh, uh, questions that I want to uh, pose to you, uh, short ones, but uh, what more is the administration doing to ensure that American businesses, manufacturers, and laborers are playing on a level playing field. And that's the whole gist at Augie and Ray's, is that they're not. They feel that we write tax policies that make it easier for people to go overseas, and then we end up in trade agreements that further uh, hurt labor uh, here at home. Uh, so what are we doing further to level the playing field uh, with their competitors? Also, and again, this is something uh, that Mr. Bustani raised as well, and I think it's generally held on the committee, our overarching concerns uh, with China, who consistently retaliate when the United States brings an issue to the WTO for enforcement. It seems that these types of retaliatory actions have in many ways stalled the United States' ability to move forward on issues like addressing currency manipulation which again has broad bipartisan support here in Congress and would have a real beneficial impact on the American workforce and send a clear message that yes, we are staunchly persistent in wanting to enforce this. And last, because in my, it's that, that same place and because it's again an export state and a lot of small businesses and major manufacturers, they rely heavily on the import-export bank. Uh, what is, as the, uh, uh, as the USTR has taken position on the uh, import-export bank, as it faces uh, expiration this fall, and yet is a vital tool, again, in terms of leveling that playing field? Well, thank you, Congressman. Let me try and uh, work my way uh, through those, starting with your, your, the, the initial observation you made about the importance of labor and environment provisions uh, being fully enforceable, uh, we agree with that. And one of the things that we have made a hallmark of our efforts to negotiate in TPP and TTIP is to seek uh, labor and environment provisions uh, that are not only fully enforceable, but also subject to dispute resolution, uh, the same uh, as any other obligation uh, in the agreement, uh, including in the, in, in the uh, instance where uh, dispute resolution, uh, where, where a party prevails in dispute resolution and the losing party doesn't come into compliance, that there would even be the, the potential of trade sanctions to enforce uh, those, uh, those obligations. 
So uh, we agree with you that that, that that needs to be a central part of the way that, that trade agreements are, are negotiated uh, in, in the 21st century. To, to touch briefly on, on the other specific issues that, that you raised, what are we doing about leveling the playing field? Part of that, I think, is a very aggressive and uh, constant effort with all of our major trading partners to open up new opportunities so that there's not uh, the ongoing situation where the U.S. market is more open than the market of our most important uh, competitors. You know, the, the, the truth of the matter, and this is something that we I think is, is relevant to the, to the philosophical question that was raised uh, uh, by Congressman Roscom, is that the U.S. Uh, market is largely already open. Uh, we made that decision beginning 60 years ago at the end of World War II. So we're, we're more open than a lot of the countries that we're most worried about. And the only way that I know of to, uh, to bring that into better alignment is to negotiate trade agreements where we lower the barriers that our competitors still maintain. But that requires us to engage and specifically to engage in trade negotiations and bring back, bring back trade agreements. The other aspect of that, I think, is enforcement and uh, demonstrating that we don't just uh, negotiate the agreements and then they go away, but rather that, that there's vigilance there and that we will ensure that other countries live up to their obligations. I think enforcement has been a hallmark uh, of this administration. Uh, just in the WTO context uh, alone, uh, we have brought 18 uh, WTO uh, enforcement cases. One of the things you mentioned is concerns about the Chinese using, using inappropriate retaliatory uh, litigation when, we, when we've brought legitimate cases. That's something we've pushed back against uh, uh, explicitly and I might add also uh, successfully in terms of their misuse of their domestic uh, anti-dumping laws. Uh, so that's a, that's a place where we're very we're very focused. The last point you raised, which I'll just touch on very briefly, because my position won't surprise you, is our is our position with regard to the uh, to uh, export import bank. Uh, of course, USTR uh, is strongly in line uh, with the position of the administration about the importance of extending uh, the Exim Bank, and uh, maybe the additional perspective that we bring to that is to see what our competitors are doing. Uh, and we know what we're up against, and I think uh, the, ex the Exim Bank is, is one of the things that helps to level the playing field in exactly the way that you were talking about. Thank you. Time of the for the latitude, Mr. Chairman, also. No problem. Uh, the time the gentleman has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Kine, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding this very important hearing. Ambassador Punk, it's good to see you again, and thanks for your service to our country. Let me ask you, Ambassador Punk, while I've got you here, a resource issue. I mean, right now we're engaged in TPP negotiations, TTIP negotiations going on, uh, trying to figure out a way to, to salvage and resurrect the Doha round, uh, the potential for plurilateral negotiations to help spur Doha. You've directly been involved in the ITA uh, negotiations, especially with China. Um, we've got the environmental uh, agreement, environmental goods agreement that's pending, trade and services agreement trade facilitation agreement coming out of the Bali ministerial round. Uh, is our team in Geneva and is our USTR team being stretched to the limit right now in regards to our negotiating uh, capacity, given all of these different items, which are tremendously important in, in their own right, but how are we doing as a Congress in making sure that you and the entire USTR team have the resources that you need in order to do an adequate job of representing this country with so many balls uh, up in the air at the same time? Uh, well, Congressman, thank you very much for that. And uh, uh, we uh, certainly are very grateful for the, re uh, the support that we've had from, from you specifically, but from the, the committee more broadly in terms of of uh, resources for the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. Uh, look, we, we pride ourselves on being uh, lean and mean at USTR, and uh, we will always uh, make do with whatever uh, resources we are given and uh, uh, live off the land or do whatever else is uh, necessary to make sure that we are, are uh, fulfilling our mission. Uh, I think Ambassador uh, Froman was asked this question a couple of, uh, of months ago and uh, noted the fact that there had been recent months, particularly during the sequester, when we were perhaps uh, a little bit leaner uh, than we wanted to be. 
uh, I think we're in a slightly better uh, position uh, as of the last couple of months. And it's been uh, gratifying, I think, to have the ability uh, to field uh, the teams in the places that we need to field them in order to engage robustly in all of the negotiations that, that, that you described. So we appreciate your support. Uh, we will make the most of, uh, of the resources that we were, are given, and we, we know that in the type of budget environment that we're in, that all of us have to uh, be very accountable in terms of, of, of how we uh, spend scarce resources. But uh, we will continue the conversation with you uh, about, about okay. resources in USTR. Well, I, I gave you a softball to give you a chance to ask for more, but I'm not hearing a specific list of concerns right now. What about retention, though? Obviously, you've been in place for about four and a half years, a little over four years. Obviously, a lot of this requires a lot of experience, background, relationship building, too. How are we doing in keeping the team constituted? We are doing pretty well, uh, given the fact that uh, USTR's very talented staff uh, has lots of opportunities. Um, I think one of the things that I love about the agency that I work at is that people are, are very dedicated to, the, to their mission. They, they, they genuinely love their work. Uh, and so people tend to stick around. That's not true across the board. Uh, and there are areas where, uh, where uh, you know, we always would hope for, for longer retention. But I think as a, uh, as a general matter, we're doing okay. Yeah. Um, what's your assessment of where Doha is uh, in the current state? And obviously, we have a new general director, Acevedo, who's tried to resurrect and breathe new life into it and that. But to say it's been uh, disappointing as far as lack of progress would be an understatement. Uh, here, I think you appreciate that, too. But this was the opportunity of being able to bring those developing and emerging economies into the global trading system, and it just seems to be a disappointment so far. Well, I, the, uh, we're at a, a critical juncture just over the next two weeks because Bali gave us a chance, but over the next two weeks we'll find out whether or not uh, WTO members are sticking to their Bali commitments. If they stick to their Bali commitments and we can continue to point to trade facilitation and the other Bali agreements as uh, areas where it worked, uh, that gives us a chance of grappling with the bigger issues like the one that you pointed out of the appropriate role of the emerging economies. If Bali falls apart, uh, it's very difficult to imagine that we're going to be able to have that conversation about post-Bali in any kind of a, of a credible way. Yeah. Geographic indicators, the EU, is this insurmountable or do we have tools with WTO to help? Well, it's a huge issue with, with the EU, as I know uh, you know well coming from where, from where you come from. And uh, I, I, I will say very clearly in the context of, uh, of TTIP uh, that we will not be uh, bringing the European system of, of geographic indications uh, to the United States. Uh, at the same time, we will be pressing uh, very hard for access uh, for our agricultural uh, products in the geographic indication domain into the European market. And that's a conversation that is uh, difficult and, uh, and, a, and very significantly different viewpoints, obviously, between us and the Europeans. But I have discovered something quite interesting in, in my time in Europe over the last uh, four and a half years. Uh, that we're injecting into that conversation, and this will be of, of interest to you, I think, uh, Congressman, and that is uh, I, I've discovered the, the phenomena uh, of something called uh, German feta cheese, and I've also discovered the phenomena of something called French Gruyere, and I'm not an expert on cheese the way that, uh, that, that people from your state might be, uh, but I do know that, uh, that Gruyere is not in France. And so uh, that's the type of, uh, of, uh, of anomaly that we're pointing out to our European colleagues in trying to uh, address this issue of geographic indications in the context of, of TTIP. All right. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Uh, the gentleman from uh, Minnesota is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ambassador. Just uh, I want to reiterate uh, just uh, uh, thank you for your uh, uh, daunting uh, and continued efforts in leadership in advancing the trade agenda. Um, 
a couple things I want to just touch on real quick. As you well know, health care is playing a very increasing role in the U.S. and, and, and global economies. Um, and there's no doubt it's the largest private sector employer in the United States. It's one of the largest and fastest growing sectors in the world economy. Uh, it's also one of our, America's key economic drivers of innovation and cutting-edge research. And it's not just pharmaceuticals or medical devices that a lot of folks just think of. We're actually talking about opportunities in our healthcare service delivery now, uh, in terms of express delivery, hospital design, doctors, nurses, insurance companies, health IT systems, uh, as well as logistics. And, you know, my colleague uh, on the committee, Ron, Ron Kind, uh, who was just uh, speaking a minute ago, and I have even gone so far as to ask Ambassador Froman to consider adding a position that would have USTR dedicated position on healthcare trade. Can you just comment or add some thoughts about the role or the importance that you see right now that this sector has in your work in Geneva or in trade negotiations? Uh, well, thank you for that question, Congressman Paulson. And uh, there's, there's no question that, that uh, we see healthcare as being an enormously important sector in all of the, the, the uh, manifestations that you described. Uh, you know, just last week in Beijing, we were pressing the Chinese uh, specifically on the information technology agreement with regard to tariffs on things like MRI machines, CAT scans, uh, implantable medical devices. But we're also very aware, as you point out, that, that healthcare is not just, is not just goods, it's also uh, significantly services. And uh, one of the, I think, most helpful or most hopeful uh, fora for seeking to promote those type of opportunities in terms of U.S. services is through, is through TISA. And whether, I mean, you mentioned uh, insurance, you mentioned health IT logistics, uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, the provision of health care services themselves. All of those are, are issues that are under discussion in the, in the TISA context right now, uh, and we see enormous uh, potential. Obviously, those are also part of the, of the various bilateral and, and regional agreements. So uh, we're very focused on that issue set. Good. Um, and let me follow up with, a, with, with sort of a different topic here. Uh, when the TRIPS agreement uh, was negotiated 20 years ago, there was some disagreement whether internet, uh, intellectual property uh, was truly a trade issue. And developments since then have certainly answered the question that the answer is yes. And IPR is now actively traded, whether it's in the form of cross-border licensing agreements or sales of IPR portfolios or cloud computing services and other services that allow foreign clients to have access to U.S. companies' intellectual property rights. In fact, IPR now accounts for the major portion of the value of many U.S. exports. If you take the iPod, for example, the value of Apple's IPR accounts now for far more than the value of the final product in terms of shipping and distribution and assembly. Yet there are a lot of countries uh, within the WTO that continue to question intellectual property rights, uh, especially copyrights and patents for innovative medicines. What are you doing to ensure that WTO members comply with those TRIPS obligations uh, to help build greater understanding within the WTO of the importance of, of IPR? Well, it's, a, it's a, an ongoing uh, uh, focal point for us in terms of, of enforcement. And I, I talked earlier about the, the premium that this administration has placed on enforcement uh, and, and specifically on intellectual property enforcement, uh, whether it's with regard to uh, the TRIPS agreement and our opportunities in uh, the WTO to pursue this uh, multilaterally, whether it's with regard to uh, a new negotiation like uh, TTIP, where we have another country in the form of the European Union that actually has quite high standards with regard to intellectual property, and we see the potential to work together to, to create a standard uh, that can be pointed to in, in future neg negotiations with, with other parties, uh, whether it's regard, with regard to a country like China, uh, or India, which was, uh, which was mentioned uh, as, as places where we have significant uh, concerns about intellectual property uh, compliance and we're, and we're pursuing enforcement, whether it's through bilateral discussions or, or litigation. We're using the whole toolbox uh, across the whole range of issues precisely because I think we recognize 
that uh, what intellectual property is about is, is innovation and protecting uh, innovators. And we obviously want to, to continue to be uh, an innovation society. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go back. Thank the gentleman. Ambassador, I'd like to thank you for your testimony today. Our record will remain open until July 30th, and I urge interested parties to submit statements to inform the committee's consideration of the issues discussed today. This hearing is now adjourned.